I have a special love for Ireland. There's something about this enchanted land that has captured my heart. So I'm traveling all around this magical country, gathering stories and playing in small pubs and town halls as I go. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. I can't believe I'm here either. <laughs> my Irish tour will climax with a sellout arena gig in front of 10,000 people. I start and end my journey in Dublin. Oh, John Bishop, follow us to <laughs> Along the way, meeting music legends, sporting heroes. Gives it in He scored again. And dating gurus. Touch the book with both hands towards your eyes for seven seconds, and you think about romance. You'll be in love and married inside of six months. There's something about Ireland that I've never got my head around, but I love more than anywhere else. I just feel better when I arrive in Ireland. The definitely has Irish blood. He yeah. just gets the crack like, yeah. or he just loves us. And or he he wants, he's a wannabe Irish person, yeah. I think. He understands the Irish people. I'm starting my journey in Dublin on the day that all of Ireland comes to a standstill. The All-Ireland Gaelic Football Final. I'm at Crow Park. I'm just going down to get my tickets because I'm going to go in to what is the most unique Irish thing in the world, the Gaelic Football Final with Dublin and Mayo. With this lot of 10, 80-odd thousand people watching amateurs play a game. <laughs> like an Irish Super Bowl, it's a match that sees over half the country crowd around the TV in pubs and living rooms for the culmination of a competition involving all of the 32 counties of the north and the south. It's the perfect expression of Irishness. How did you get a ticket? <laughs> I'll tell you how I got a ticket, because Ticketmaster have got a box and I make a load of money for Ticketmaster. Hey, John, he's paid 230 euro out of his hotel room to go and see you. Can you believe that? Jesus! I say you can come and have a bath with me after the gig. <laughs> this year is a proper David and Goliath contest with the bookies making the City Boys of Dublin odds on favourite to beat their country cousins of Mayo. My guide for the day is my mate Quinny, whose family are mayo born and bred. Hey, you're going to you're gonna have to decide which one you're going for. I know, I'm going to have to mayo. pick a side. What about you? You're going mayo? Mayo. All right, I'll, uh, I'll go mayo for you, Mum. Yes, there you go. Who are you looking for? Me, mayo. Right. It's the Duchess of Mayo! Duchess of Mayo, you're right! <laughs> <laughs> you can identify a good thing when you see it. Having made my choice for the underdogs, there were still some who thought I could be persuaded. Did you wax your chest yeah. before you came out? Yeah. Yeah, you I've like never you known a man more desperate to get his shirt yeah. off. <laughs> The players, are they only allowed to go to one barber? <laughs> Is the one man cutting the heads of all the GAA going, ah, I'll leave you now, boy, go on, off you go, boy. I'll leave you, boy. And a thing to remember when you look at this ground. 80-odd thousand people, not one professional on a pitch. They're all amateurs, and they're all playing for the county in which they were born. Something unique about that. There's no other country in the world that'll have a game watched by 85,000 people, televised live, everybody in the country watching it, and the lads on the pitch are getting a, a, what, a bag of crisps and a pint of Guinness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Being in the biggest choir ever, or oh, singing the national anthem. 
Formality's over, it's time to get down to business. Many want to watch this football in England, mate, 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 that makes people all over. They should come and watch some of this. There's fellas pulling each other's ear and ears and punching and everything. The proper game. It is a mixture between. I suppose the game of football to me, it's a mixture between football, rugby and, and GBH. It's just <laughs> fighting and everything, and it was brilliant. I loved it, the fact that they were going to go to work the following day with no teeth. <laughs> Mayo just lost the player because he punched one of the Dublin players off the ball. And apparently in Gaelic football, you can't punch them off the ball. You can only punch them when they've got the ball. I went with a mate whose family's from Mayo, so that's why I picked Mayo. But I also picked Mayo because I like the underdog. <laughs> and, then, and then I found out about the case. <laughs> Since winning in 1951, Mayo have lost the final seven times. This is their eighth attempt. And it's said that there's been a case placed on the Mayo Gaelic football team since 1951 because when they went back to the county, they were travelling through a village called Foxford where they didn't stop to pay the respects at a funeral. So either a woman or a priest put a case on the bus and said Mayo will never win the All-Ireland again till everyone on the bus is dead. <laughs> From the victorious 1951 team, there are two surviving players. According to the case, Mayo will keep losing as long as they live. And sure enough, Dublin take the lead. I couldn't believe this idea. But you're never going to win until everyone on the bus is dead. <laughs> With 16 minutes to go, the ball was delivered to Mayo superstar Lee Keegan. Lee Keegan on 54 minutes steps up to put Mayo in front. Is this the year that Mayo finally lift the case? Like Liverpool haven't won. The Premier League for 20 odd years, but none of us got worse because we're cursed. <laughs> the teams are level, and in the dying seconds after 70 years of heartache, Mayo get the opportunity they've been dreaming of. If they can kick the ball between the posts, they will finally break the curse. So it's on the way, I think. Is it off the post? <laughs> That's your case. <laughs> Having been inches away from victory, Mayo's luck appears to have run out. The tension is unbearable. One kick will decide victory. I, along with 80,000 fans and an entire nation, watch with bated breath. It'll be heartbreak for Mayo, six minutes into stoppage time. Rock kicking up into the air and over the bar. Champions. Well, once again, defeat is Mayo's lot. Luck just wasn't on their side at the very end of all of that. But it's Dublin who are the champions. What a game. I think, it, to be fair, you have to thank the English for it. <laughs> you wouldn't come up with a game like that unless you've been oppressed for 800 years. <laughs> After the game, I get a chance to catch up with Mayo goal scorer Lee Keegan. <laughs> Lee, it's great to meet you. Great. Mainly because I want to find out what it's like to play Gaelic, but also your goal thought that's it, the game's changed. So, so did I. <laughs>
So for you, that's not your first All Ireland final, is it? No, it's my actually it was really it was my fifth. So your fifth, fifth final, yeah. But it was only at the game I was told about the case. Now, <laughs> I know you. I, I know when you sat this down. Curse. You, when you sat down, you said, sort of, "Don't ask me about the case." But I've got it last year because for anybody outside of Ireland, it's not something we know about. But because you keep getting so close, you're almost saying yeah. it's, 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 it's playing out. Yeah, and this is the thing, I suppose, every year we get to a final and it's, it, it's become well documented now in the last kind of more five or six years that since 1951 is our last All-Ireland winning team. I actually feel sorry for them because the curse is put on them because they're still alive, which is worse. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're, they're our heroes of Mayo that won the, won the last All-Ireland. Like, but um, yeah. Do I, I actually heard an interview from New Zealand that were on about the curse there last week. I was like, oh, it, it's travelling around the world. Like, so you're thinking there, there has to be something here. But no, it's no curse. I, I'd be very, I suppose, realistic in terms when you're talking about Gaelic is you have a winner and you lose her. And it breaks my heart to say it, but you have to give full credit to a team that we play against. Like Dublin are absolutely unbelievable. But it was so close. Close, I know. And close. that's, so that's, that's heartbreaking. It, it, like, it breaks my heart to say we lost by a point again. I suppose that's why you know you see so many emotions after a game. So you always see the winning team, the losing team, and there's me crying like a baby. Join me after the break when I'll be continuing my journey in Cork. Welcome to Cork. I'll be meeting friends, fairies, and fish, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> Leaving Dublin, my next stop is Cork. The second biggest city in the Republic of Ireland, the locals would have you believe it's the real capital. And in the heart of what is colloquially known as the Rebel County, a great place for a gig. So I've just done the sound check. I'm at Cork Opera House. This is the backstage glamour. This is it. This is dressing room number one, which means this is the best one. And this is me rider. So I've got... Some snacks, some chocolate, some, some nuts. I've kind of got the same rider that you would have if you've just broke up with somebody and you're at home. The only thing that's missing is wine. Please welcome to the stage, Mr John Fisher! Thank you. Nice to be here in what I've been told is the official capital. It's not. <laughs> OK, so it might not be the capsule, but its past and present is as wrapped up with Irish mysticism as anywhere. You can't avoid lucky charms. Leprechauns and fairies are on virtually every Irish high street. Irish folklore is seen as the hallmark of Irish culture, and you can even study a degree in it at the University College of Cork with folklorist Shane Lehane. Ireland's a place to me that seems... I don't know, it seems more alive when it comes to its belief and its relationship between, I suppose, the mysticism that you might call mm -hmm. part of folklore and the reality of normal life. There doesn't seem that disconnect that we get in other cultures. Well, why do you think that is? Irish people love talking. They love hearing themselves talking. They love stories. They love recounting events. They create sort of nuances of entertainment out of the most mundane things. And within that, I think, there's this almost kind of national sort of love of sort of mystery and intrigue and detail. And I think that's part of the Irish character. I'm coming to your lecture. What's oh, your yeah. lecture on this morning? Uh, fairies. Fairy tradition. The oh, belief fairy. in the fairies, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. You'll enjoy that now. I went to a lecture about folklore because you can do a degree in Irish folklore that's brilliant that <laughs> and I went to a lecture about the fairies <laughs> first thing I want you to do is forget about Tinkerbell the Irish people don't think of fairies that way the fairies are exactly the same as you and I they might even be in the room with us here okay? the difference is we can't see them the fairies are interested in blood. Yeah, the vampire tradition. They were also interested in taking children from this world. OK. Your fairies aren't like our fairies. <laughs> Back in the real world, in the centre of the city is the English market, 
Cork's famous covered market has been trading since 1788 and is hugely popular with tourists and shoppers alike. Oh, and comedians. My mate Des Bishop is an American stand-up who has made Ireland his home. So John, you know, that's, that's Irish. Do you think you could pronounce that correctly? <laughs> I'll give it a go. Seed mail, fair say. Hold that, hold the line. I'll, I'll correct the first. It's, it's, it's Cade Mila Fulcher. Cade Mila Fulcher. Perfect. Next. Seed Mila Ahadra. You can't have a go at me for that. <laughs> so I, it. I corrected you already. It's Cade Mila Fulcher. Ahadra. Ahadra. <laughs> yeah, but I told you it was Irish, not like. What about the last line? Can you get that? Seed Mila Ahadra or San Francisco. <laughs> Yeah, it's Cade Mila Fulcher, Jorge, or San Francisco. Well, uh, 100,000 welcomes to our friends from San Francisco and, and Liverpool. I was with Des Bishop today. So, oh, Des. Somewhere, somewhere, we're convinced we're related. <laughs> because we've got the same jaw. That's about it, but it's good enough for me. I always tell, like, when American guys are coming over, I always say, listen, man, the Irish will appreciate a bit of local. I know some comics like to look, frown on it, you know, yeah. like, oh, but Irish love a bit of local. And you're in a better city, this is the best city to do a bit of local because Cork people see themselves as very unique, distinct from the rest of Ireland. So yeah. if you can touch into a little bit of that, not only do you win over the Cork audience, but you win over the rest of Ireland because the rest of Ireland thinks Cork is different too. <laughs> <laughs> I arrived in Cork today and I've been through Cork Airport before. And I, I love what you've done with it. I don't know if anyone's flown in recently, but there's, have, you, have you seen the pictures when you arrive? Like most airports, you know, you go to somewhere like New Zealand and there'll be a photograph of a Maori or something, or you land in America and you'll see photographs of American footballers saying, welcome to New York. You get off a cork and it's just ginger people. <laughs> Different shades of ginger people. <laughs> Welcome to Cork. I don't know whether I would have been doing what I'm doing now if it hadn't have been for Ireland and the Irish culture and the acceptance. Yeah. Is that the same for you? Do you think you could have started being a stand-up had you stayed in America? I definitely wouldn't have been as successful as quickly, but it was like immediate. There was tons of material, there was tons of appreciation, yeah. and it was just like, I felt like a superstar. Within six months. But that's the thing for me as well. When I found where you come in, you, the Irish people oh, want you to sort of see them. They want you to look at them and point back at them and go, oh, look, you're funny because oh, yeah, of this. Oh, yeah, they love it. Whereas, like, the Irish so audience is a performance-enhancing drug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's not a brilliant way of putting it. Yeah, the show audience is a performance-enhancing Yeah, it's not fair. I met a fella, met a fella called Pat O'Connell. He met the Queen. He was the fishmonger. When the Queen was there in the English market, he met her, which really surprised me because I didn't think the Queen would be buying her own fish. <laughs> Hello, Hello, John. John. How are you? Good, Good to see you, man. Lovely yeah, to nice to meet you. Welcome to the market again. Oh, Thanks. You're famous. He's the fishmonger. He met the Queen. <laughs> Back in 2011. The Queen became the first reigning British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland in over a century. Is that the fish that you were pointing out when the Queen was laughing? It was, it was yeah, and, and I think that was the gamble in my life, I'll be honest, John. Why? What, what, what? In Cork, that's a mother in law fish. <laughs> Something to do with the teeth, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and the Queen obviously didn't know Pat O'Connell, and I wasn't sure if she'd get the sense of humour that we have in Cork. And it was only a couple of weeks after the royal wedding between Kate and William. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so we had this beautiful array of crab and lobster and prawns, and we had a really big one of these beauties. And we did the usual stuff when we came up, and she said, my gosh, what's that? And I said, well, do I cause a diplomatic incident, or do I give him the real name? So I said, being a corp, man, I said, that's a mother-in-law fish. And she just got it. She just she thought absolutely it thought it was hilarious. <laughs> but then it was amazing, actually, because that was the kind of thing that broke the ice. Because after that, I kind of said, this lady's OK, this lady's got a sense of humour. I've got to ask you, did the Queen buy anything? She's got fish off us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's proper, isn't it? You know, there's a photograph of him, an Irishman, a Corkman from the Rebel County, 
making the Queen laugh. That's as good as Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Reaching out and bridging the divide. But also, I never thought I'd come to Cork and meet somebody else who's done what I've done, because I've met the Queen. I met the Queen, and when I met the Queen, I was determined not to bow. And I thought, I'm not going to bow. I'm going to say, well, I'm not going to bow. And she could see in my eyes I wasn't going to bow. So she just went like that with her hand. And she's only little, isn't she? <laughs> she's a little thing. So she just put her hand like this, so I had to reach for it. And then I'm, I'm started then. I'm like, I've got to <laughs> You think the Queen was aware of it? Oh, she knows. She knows. I'm going to go now. Because I am... I'm, oh, oh, stop it. By the way, this isn't a pretend I'm going. You know where people go, I'm going, and you go, oh, great, great, that was lovely, it's great, let's get the kind off. He's back. You know, that, that like, oh, I'm going, I'm coming back, and uh, you're going, we're all pretending you're after an encore. No, no, that, that doesn't happen. I don't do that. This is the only job in the world where people pretend to leave work. <laughs> No one else does that. You're not going to go to work tomorrow and go, right, I'm just there leaving the office. I'm, I'm off, I'm leaving. I'm, no, I'm not, I'm back. <laughs> you don't do that, do you? You don't do that. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, what I was going to say is thank you for coming, thanks for being here, and God willing, I'll see you again in the future. <laughs> Next week, I meet a love guru and find out the link between a holy apparition and an international airport.